Welcome to this module of the Professor Messer's free a certification training course. I'm James Messer, your host for this module. And in this module, we're going to step through troubleshooting theory and the best practices when you start troubleshooting. One of our, our previous modules, we talked about the troubleshooting theory itself. But when you're actually troubleshooting, there's some certain techniques that you should keep in mind that are going to help you as you go down that troubleshooting road. Now, the objectives as they come from the CompTIA exam are to recognize the basic aspects of troubleshooting theory. So you'll certainly have some questions about this on your exam. Let's start stepping through what those best practices might be when you're doing some troubleshooting. And what's great about best practices is oftentimes they make a whole lot of sense and something you probably should be doing when you're performing your troubleshooting. This is something that is a mantra in the IT industry. Before you make a change, make sure that you back up. Make sure you have a way to go back once you make this change. Because if you happen to do something that causes more problems, you're going to need to back that out. So before you do any type of change, make sure that you have a backup in place. Now, there's different kinds of backups. Oftentimes, when I'm editing a file on my, on my server, on my web server, I'll make a backup just of that file. I'll copy the file, and I'll, I'll name it with the date that I'm making the change. And I'll oftentimes find that I have 10 or 11 different copies. So if I need to go back to a, one that I did a month ago, it's still sitting there. And that way, if I go into my editor and I really start deleting things I shouldn't delete, I can revert back to a previous version. There are also application backups that you can do. Oftentimes, databases are a good example of this. The database application itself may have a backup option in there that takes everything associated with that application and backs it up. And that way, if you do make a change, you can simply restore the data associated with that application. And that has nothing to do with the file server underneath or the operating system. It's really just for that application. Now, one of the major types of backups, if you really want to be certain that you capture everything on a system, is to really back up an entire disk or an entire partition. And there's some great mirroring programs, they call them, that create an image of the hard drive that essentially take a sector-by-sector -sector copy. It is a perfect copy of that hard drive and saves it off so that you can later on restore that if you want to be able to do that. There's uh, That is the ultimate in being able to save a system. I'll oftentimes create that kind of backup when I'm ready just to every week or so back up everything that I have on my hard drive. And I use that particular backup methodology because during the week, if I happen to have a hard drive failure or I happen to erase a file I wasn't expecting, I can go back to the weekend and pull that file off. Very important to have that if only for your systems at home that you're using. Now, if you're going to roll something back, make sure that you have a recovery plan, that you've tested this. Copying files is easy. You copy one back and forth. Not really much testing you have to do there. But things like an application backup, you may find the backup process for an application it really intends to make a backup. But you may find when you restore it that the backup process really wasn't what you were expecting. It, it didn't back up everything you were expecting it to back up. Or perhaps it's a flawed backup that doesn't work the way that it was designed to work. And in those cases, you don't want to be left with having no way to revert back to something that you knew was working the very beginning of this process. Backup, backup, backup. Cannot say it enough. Another thing you want to be sure to do when you're assessing these problems is do it in a very systematic way. Oftentimes, you're going to run into these very large problems. They extend across different locations. There might be 20 different file servers involved. There might be many different application servers across many different groups. And in those cases, it's almost overwhelming to have all of those types of systems and people and resources all having a problem that you need to resolve. What you want to do is break this up into smaller components, smaller pieces, and attack it a little bit at a time. Just don't let the big picture overwhelm you. Because when you start looking at each individual piece systematically, what you're going to find is you can apply that troubleshooting process we spoke of in an earlier module. We can now start applying that into each smaller piece. And that allows you to start analyzing it. And when you now need to solve these very important problems very quickly, that really helps you down the road when you're trying to say, this particular server is working exceptionally. This particular server I'm having questions about. So you can now focus your efforts in what you're doing. 
This works for almost everything. You divide up into smaller pieces. You conquer those particular issues or look at it on an individual basis. And once you are completely certain that a problem is not in that smaller piece, you can go to the next smaller piece. And uh, it's not just IT. You can apply that into doing things like resolving a problem with your automobile. And in those particular cases, it's, it's all mechanical, but it's still the same process, dividing up into smaller pieces and conquering it a tiny piece at a time. Things that you'll want to look at may even be very, very obvious. Don't overlook those. Very often, it's the obvious things that you often come back to and realize, had you looked at that to begin with, you would have already had this problem solved. So you could save a lot of time just by looking at the simple things. And because they are simple, it often takes no time at all to make sure that you've checked them and that you can go on to the next piece. That's why you often begin the troubleshooting process with, is it plugged in? And 99% of the time, yeah, it's plugged in. We already got that far. It's surprisingly enough, oftentimes somebody will say, oh, I'm not sure. There was somebody looking at this yesterday, and they'll plug it in and solve the entire issue. Something simple. And you can say, yep, happens to me all the time. Thanks, glad it's working, and you go to the next issue. So also don't make any assumptions about these problems that you run into. There is oftentimes you're going to have a chance to solve these problems very easily. And oftentimes you're going to be asking people these very obvious things. Is there power? Is a light on? Do you hear any strange noises? Something very obvious about it. But be sure you ask the questions. Don't just skip over those pieces. When it's quick and easy, it's very, very nice to have it out of the way. And these obvious problems are oftentimes very quick and very easy to resolve. When you're researching ideas and trying to figure out what to do first, you're going to want to make sure that you have a good library to pull from. These are This is where you're going to start trying to figure out where to attack the problem first. And you'll go to third-party books, a library, or even a bookstore, a great resource. Oftentimes, large organizations will have a technical library that they'll buy from, from Amazon, from the local bookstore. And they'll just keep these technical manuals up there that are written by people that are really well-known and have worked a lot with those particular pieces of hardware or those pieces of software. Oftentimes, I'll often run across really good articles in trade magazines. I'll rip them out. I'll image them. I'll find electronic versions of that, or I'll find that the version of that online, and I'll bookmark it and have it available to use later on as well. Oftentimes, a manufacturer will also send product CDs or manuals on CD. And I'll keep those CDs and DVDs nearby. Because so oftentimes, I can do a search across every single manual from that manufacturer and get some hits very quickly on where the problems might be. Now, online, one of the obvious places to go is Google. Everybody uses some type of search engine to find, find a, a websites on the internet. Oftentimes, I'll find information in something that called Google Groups. This is the Usenet News Group. Groups. Not used a lot anymore, but they're a great resource for some older types of problems that crop up. And oftentimes, I find new problems listed there as well. So be sure to search for Google Groups to find some of those pieces you might be looking for. A lot of manufacturers, I've noticed now, are also starting some really nice communities online. If you go to Adobe's website or Microsoft's website, they have forums set up that you can communicate user to user. Very oftentimes, you have smart people from those companies stopping by as well. And they're also able to give you information about where that problem might be. So plan your attack. And always have a plan B. Always think that if it isn't this particular problem, Go to the next step. Always know what your next step is going to be. It's almost like a chess game. You need to have three steps ahead. Know exactly what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you're going to get those resources from, and what steps you can do to get the particular problem resolved as quickly as possible. Now, what about best practices for documentation? When you find a problem, there's probably a story behind it, something that you've seen, something you noticed, you had to go through a troubleshooting process. You're never going to run out of this type of documentation, these types of stories. Make sure that you have some way to get that documentation down so that you can tell people you troubleshooted this particular piece of software, you ran into these particular kinds of problems, or here's the type of error that you'll see that's very unique and we've never seen this before and we're able to resolve it with these particular things that we did. You're going to document not only what it is, but what it isn't. Sometimes you'll see an error crop up and you may find that that particular problem 
looks clearly like it's related to memory. It's a memory problem. So you swap the memory out, and it didn't fix the problem. That wasn't the issue. What it really was was something else that you found. So you may want to document that this will manifest itself as this particular problem, which clearly looks like it's memory, but it's not. Don't be fooled. And you have that documentation that other people can use to make sure they don't go down a road that's not really going to solve the problem for them. Ultimately, you're going to want to write down what the outcome really was. Sometimes you're going to find that you're not actually going to fix the problem. You're going to find a workaround. Sometimes when you load up a new driver for a printer, for instance, that you may find the new driver is having a problem. It's not working the way you would expect it. And what you'll find is that by going back to a previous version, you've gotten rid of this issue that you had. You didn't actually fix the existing driver. You just moved it back to a previous version. In fact, you may have not had now some of the new features that were in the new driver. That's OK. You fixed the problem, and perhaps the end user wasn't using those new features anyway. So you want to document that that resolution that you had for this problem, not always a fix, but it's just as good as a fix because it resolved the issue and didn't cause any problems for the end user. Make sure you include all the different options of the outcomes that you had so that other people can see that process as well and know that the particular problem you had is not one related to some of those others. So that's our troubleshooting theory best practices. Make sure you back up all the time. Make sure that all of those changes are something you can roll back later on. When you get a big problem that you have to resolve, make sure you use that systematic process. Break it down into those smaller pieces. And when you are finally at the point where you're troubleshooting, make sure it's not something obvious. Fix those obvious things right off the bat. Those are often the quickest and easiest to resolve. When you are establishing priorities and doing research, have all of those things in front of you so that you can make determinations on what you need to do first, what you need to do second, what you need to do third. Have all of those ready to go. And ultimately, when you're finished, make sure that you document all of those findings. Make sure that the actions and the outcomes are something that someone can go back to later and see what it was you did to resolve that particular kind of problem. Well, that ends this particular module on our free a certification exam. For more of Professor Messer's free a certification, visit our website at freeaplus.com for more message boards, more forums, and a lot more A-plus certification resources.